There has been ample time in the 14 months since he announced the referendum for Anthony Albanese to make a pub-ready argument for The Voice. And this is probably the best he can do. And this is an opportunity to advance our nation and to give respect to Indigenous Australians, but also for non-Indigenous Australians. It won't have any impact in a direct way on their lives, but it will make us feel better about who we are as a nation. It will send a signal to ourselves and to the world that we're a mature nation that is coming to terms with the fullness of our history and that we're proud of sharing this great continent of ours with the oldest continuous culture on earth. Convinced? Neither am I. It's all about the sentiment, voting for the voice on the vibe, because we care about the plight of the less fortunate and because, to quote the Prime Minister, it'll make us feel better about who we are as a nation. Well, I'm sorry, Prime Minister, most Australians feel pretty good about the place already. What worries them is what the voice will make. The voice will make a great country worse. It will re-racialise our nation and our constitution. It'll end any pretense that our constitution is racially neutral, unlike the United States, where the Supreme Court is bound to uphold the principle of racial neutrality under the 14th Amendment. Justice John Marshall Harlan, in a lone dissent to the Supreme Court's 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson decision, described it this way. Our constitution is colourblind and knows neither and neither knows nor tolerates classes amongst citizens. Australia's 14th Amendment moment, as far as we've had one, was to, in two decisions taken in 1967 under the short-lived government of Harold Holt. The first decision was to end the white Australia policy. In the spirit of Dr Martin Luther King Jr's declaration four years earlier, it allowed immigration decisions to be based on character, not race. The second turning point was the referendum in May 1967, passed by a majority of 90.4%. That referendum's intention was to remove any grounds for official discrimination against a particular race with reference to the particular reference to the census. Anthony Albanese is asking us to change that in the amendment before us at the referendum on October 14. This is not about equal rights, equal respect and equal opportunity it will grant special rights to Indigenous people, extra political authority, a louder voice and more influence than other citizens. It will institutionalise discrimination for the first time in our history, positive discrimination in favour of one group, defined by race, which inevitably means discriminating against others. The notion that it's possible to discriminate in favour of one group without prejudic prejudicing the rights of another was firmly refuted earlier this year in a US Supreme Court decision upholding the 14th Amendment. The Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional for universities to offer special admission deals to African-American students. To do so would discriminate against white, Asian and Latino students applying for a fixed number of college places. The most eloquent defender of the court's decision was Justice Clarence Thomas. Justice Thomas is an African-American born in 1948 in Pinpoint, Georgia, in the then segregated South. After his father abandoned his family, he was raised by his grandfather in a poor Gullah community near Savannah, speaking English as his second language. Thomas is amongst a shrinking minority of African-Americans who could claim, reasonably claim to have been directly harmed by the segregationist policies in the place for the first 20 years of his life. Yet he makes no such claim warning of the hidden dangers of pursuing historical grievances. He said, quote, Today's 17-year-olds, after all, did not live through the Jim Crow era, enact or enforce segregation laws, or take any action to oppress or enslave the victims of the past. They do not shoulder the moral depths of their ancestors. Our nation should not punish today's youth for the sins of the past. The temptation to equate the history of US race relations with our own is, for the most part, best avoided. Australia did not experience slavery or Jim Crow, 
And to the extent that Australians have resolved their differences, they've done so without a civil war. They've not experienced the bitterness and racial violence that culminated in the 1964 Civil Rights Act or the divisiveness of the Black Lives Matter movement. Yet the spirit of the 14th Amendment and the clarity Justice Thomas brings should help us marshal our thoughts as we consider the radical change we're being asked to make to our system of government at the next referendum. As Thomas says, I quote, only that promise can allow us to look past our differing skin colours and identities and see each other for what we truly are, individuals with unique thoughts, perspectives and goals, but with equal dignity and equal rights under the law. What matters is not the barriers they face, but how they choose to confront them. And their race is not to blame for everything good or bad that happens in their lives. A contrary myopic worldview based on individual skin color to the total exclusion of their personal choices is nothing short of racial determinism.